One of the biggest topics in MMA, not only in the past couple of weeks with some of the questionable decisions, but just in all of MMA has been about the MMA judging system. How does judging work? How do judges look at fights? And why does it look like certain fighters are getting robbed left and right, yet it's getting defended by some of the fans? And why does the organization, why does the UFC talk about effective striking, grappling, aggression, and octagon control? Don't you score all of that at one time? Or what's actually going on here? Well, I did make a video back in the day, this is a couple years ago, breaking down a bit of the scoring system, but I found it best to have a revised version of this. After getting more experience at looking at fights, the way that the rules are set. Back in the time, I just read it, and I kind of went over it with you guys. But now, as we've gone through years with this scoring system, I, as well as many, have a better grasp on how fights are actually scored. And this is pretty much how it goes down. Now, disclaimer, I personally do not agree with how fights are scored I would have changed many many things and I've talked about it on podcasts in the past many things I would change about the scoring system but regardless of what I feel regardless of what you feel or we all feel the judging should be like they are concrete there are a set of rules for scoring fights that regardless of what we feel like we need to score it by or at least the judges need to score it by we should understand it if we're going to be talking about it because it does seem like a lot of people have a point of contention they disagree with many fights the way they're scored but when they talk about it i normally see like over 50 percent of the time most are scoring fights incorrectly for an example, shout out to Laura Sanko on Twitter where she posted a question to see how many people actually know how to score fights. And the numbers are pretty staggering. With over 24,000 votes on that poll where she asked the fans if fighter A takes fighter B down with a high crotch, lifts him up, slams him down, but fighter B gets immediately up, fighter B takes fighter A down with a body trip and controls fighter A on the ground for two minutes, literally nothing else happens in the round, who wins? With nearly 27,000 votes, 78% said that fighter B should win by tripping fighter A to the ground and doing nothing but controlling them for two minutes. But Laura Senko knew the answer to this. She actually was talking with certain people that were better experts at judging. The correct answer is fighter A. So the fact that it shows that almost 80% of people do not know how to score a fight, it influenced me to revise my older video and talk about how scoring actually goes. Because if almost 80% of the fans don't know how to score a fight, yet most of them are talking about scoring, they're talking about judging, they're saying a fighter should win this fight, yet they don't know how it works it seems like my older video didn't do the job so if any of you know anybody that don't know how to score fights and they constantly annoy you by saying fighters are robbed and stuff please link them this video refer to this video and hopefully they will understand how to judge a fight because man it's been five years since the rules have been written at this point everybody should know how the scoring works so these are the official rules of mma that were put in place back in 2017 so any scoring system you see before 2017 does not matter they're irrelevant, they don't exist anymore. Now, the judging system is scored by a 10-point must system. Usually, points do not go lower than 7, with a maximum of 10. And there is a possibility to score around 10-10, but this is nearly impossible to ever do, and you're going to see why. But first, here is the most important thing about the judging system. They don't make it complicated, it's actually very simple to read. It's basically going to tell you that the rules are based on a supremacy order, or judged individually, not all together. Effective striking, aggression, octagon control, are not judged together you have to go one by one and the number one thing you look at before you look at anything else is effective striking and grappling that is literally the only thing you're going to look at if the impact of the striking and grappling is exactly the same which is almost impossible to ever happen then you get off of striking and grappling and you go to aggression who had the better aggression if that is 100% equal, which is even closer to impossible, then you get off of aggression and you go to octagon control, which is going to talk about position control, cage control, all that stuff. If effective striking and grappling is not 100% equal, you never look at aggression and you never look at octagon control. And that is very, very important to know. Pretty much the winner of the fight is the fighter that gets closer to finishing off their opponent using effective striking and grappling. Effective aggressiveness and octagon control are most of the time not going to get judged at all. For most fights you're ever going to see, aggressiveness and octagon control mean nothing just pretend they don't exist. It's about damage, who gets closer to finishing, and just with a quick normie summary of each 
category, effective striking is basically who I'll damage to, and the guy who lands like one big punch beats someone who lands like 10 weak punches. Effective grappling is who uses their grappling like submissions and takedowns that get closer to finishing off the fight. So if I get a submission on you and I almost finish you, I get in like a deep arm bar and you somehow survive, and you just control me for like four minutes after and do nothing, I won the round. Because I got closer to finishing you. You just laying on top of me, you didn't do anything to get close to finishing the fight, so it doesn't even matter if you lay on top of me. If I just get a submission off on you and I get pretty close, and that's all I pretty much needed. Now, effective aggressiveness is pretty much who advances forward trying to actually successfully using their aggression to land certain things or get some kind of effect out of it. There's a big difference between effective aggressiveness and being reckless. Someone who's reckless can lose on aggressiveness. And then fighting area control is pretty much just controlling. That means on the ground, that means up against the cage, that means in the distance, in the stand up, whatever it is, who pretty much is controlling the position and placement of the fight. And that also means like laying on top of someone when they're on the ground or controlling them up against the fence, a la Francis Gone vs. Surreal Gone and Holly Holm vs. Caitlin Vieira. Control is the least important thing when it comes to a fight, it's the last last thing you look at. So Surreal Gan's submission against Francis Ngannou in the fifth round is going to matter much more than laying on top of you because you have to look at the submission first. But you do have people who are going to say, oh, but Francis got out of it and he controlled him. He was on top of him. Again, you do not look at that aspect. You don't look at Francis laid on top of him because there was a submission that happened. If a submission happened, you don't even look at the control ever. You never look at a fighter laying on top of the other. It should even cross the judging. Effective striking and grappling shall be considered the first priority of round assessments. Effective aggressiveness is plan B and should not be considered unless the judge does not see any advantage in effective striking and grappling. Cage and ring control plan C should only be needed when all other criteria are 100% even for both competitors. This is an extremely rare occurrence. What this means is effective striking and grappling is always going to take priority first. You're not going to look at aggressiveness. You're not going to look at octagon or cage control if effective striking and grappling is not 100% equal. And that's literal. Now that goes to aggressiveness as well. Aggressiveness is going to be taken before cage control. You're never going to look at control if there's any advantage in aggressiveness, if that's not 100% equal. The last thing, the least important thing is control. The least important. That's going to answer a lot of people's questions because a lot of people believe when it comes to grappling that control is actually important. Or if they put them up against the cage and hold them like Holly Holm versus Caitlin Vieira, that is important. When in fact, it is not important. It's the least important important thing in the whole criteria. You will probably never go to this. You'll probably never score or judge control ever. But what is most important is effective striking and grappling. And it goes as this. Legal blows that have an immediate or cumulative impact with the potential to contribute towards the end of the match with the immediate weighing in more heavily than the cumulative impact. Unquote. Now this is about striking. This is the only thing that they talk about striking. The rest of this is going to be about grappling because striking is very obvious. The more damage the blow causes, especially the immediate, is going to be the highest rewarded thing in any fight. That means if I land one big punch on you and I stun you, yet you land like 10 rabbit punches, I'm going to win because I landed that one immediate big punch. It doesn't matter if you land a 10 to my one, I still beat you because I caused more damage. And that's actually what the people that wrote the rules even stated. The rules were intended for damage to trump everything else, for offense to be above everything else. They really want to award offense. So the more damage someone causes, the heavier it's going to be when it comes to the judging. And when it talks about potential to contribute towards the end of the match, that's a fancy way to say the closer guy to get to a finish. So again, if I land five big punches on you, you land 30 extremely weak punches, rabid punches against the cage that have no effect on me, I beat you in that round because I landed those five big punches. That's ultimately how it goes down. Now, in some of the older rules, this was not the case. And I think that's why a lot of people are confused about the new rules now because they were so used to judging on who struck more, who had a higher punch count rather than who caused the most damage. Now, does this always mean that immediate is going to trump cumulative? No, not necessarily, because it has to potentially contribute to the end of the match. If cumulative damage can get closer to a finish than the immediate shots, for an example, you look at Nate Diaz's fights, that's when cumulative is going to weigh more than immediate. Nate Diaz is a perfect example of a guy who is able to put together a cumulative amount of damage 
and beat someone that had more immediate damage on him because he got closer to finishing the match. For an example, the third round with uh, Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor. You can look at Nate Diaz's fight with Anthony Pettis. You can look at Nate Diaz's fight with Michael Johnson. Nate would get hit with bigger punches, but he was able to put together like 20 strikes together that started to wear on the opponent and start to damage them. So he was able to win the rounds. Anthony Pettis was landing big shots on Nate. He was landing big left hooks, but he was losing the rounds because the amount of damage that Nate was able to put together with a bunch of strikes eventually trumped those left hooks. If you want to see a fighter that has that cumulative part that's going to trump the immediate part, Nate Diaz is the perfect fighter to look at. But on the other way, the way the rules are intended to show, a very extreme version of this would be like Chito Vera versus Rob Font, where Rob Font greatly outstruck Chito Vera when it came to strike count. Font landed over 100 strikes more than Chito, but he was still losing rounds because Chito was knocking him down and hurting him when he would touch him. That's when immediate weighs more than the cumulative, but you don't have to go to that aspect where you're knocking the opponent to the ground and stuff. You don't need to knock them down to have the immediate damage weighing over the cumulative. Even with Caitlyn Vieira versus Holly Holm, it's the same exact thing. Caitlyn, even though she wasn't dropping home or rocking her all over the place like that, her immediate shots were more effective than Holly Holm's cumulative. Because ultimately, Holly Holm's cumulative, at least most of them, weren't really having much of an effect on Caitlyn Vieira at all. Where sometimes when Caitlyn would hit Holly Holm, Holm would stumble from the shots a little bit. Even that little bit of motion reaction to those shots is enough to warrant Caitlyn Vieira the immediate impact advantage and ultimately giving her the rounds. Then we go to grappling, and this is where it gets a little bit more complex. Quote, successful execution of takedown submission attempts reversals and achievement of advantageous positions that produce immediate or cumulative impact with the potential to contribute to the end of the match with the immediate way more heavily than the cumulative impact. It shall be noted that a successful takedown is not merely a changing of position, but the establishment of an attack from the use of the takedown. That's very important. Top and bottom position fighters are assessed more on the impactful, effective result of their actions, more so than their position. This criterion will be the deciding factor in the majority of decisions when scoring a round. The next two criteria must be treated as a backup, unquote. So that is about effective grappling. It still has the immediate over cumulative impact thing and things like submission attempts, takedowns themselves, reversals and achievements of advantageous positions that produce the immediate or cumulative impact. So it leads up to it to a potential finish of the match. That is where you're gonna have to count as effective grappling. So this can come in the way of high amplitude slams, big takedowns, almost choking the opponent out, reversal and gaining like their back or something. The closer you get to finishing the fight with your grappling, that is ultimately the thing that's gonna trump everything else. Now the immediate over cumulative thing is kind of ambiguous or it's like, it's like a bit unknown. I think they should have explained what immediate and cumulative actually mean when it comes to grappling a little bit more. This is actually where it gets the most confusing out of all the judging criteria. I could take it as, for an example, I attempt a couple submissions on you, but I don't really get that close. I go in for an arm bar, you slip out immediately, it wasn't locked in. I go for a leg lock after, not really in there, you get out of it. I try to get you into a guillotine after, but nothing's really getting close to finishing you off. But then you get like one big triangle choke on me, it's deep, it's locked in, I'm fighting for my life to get out of there. Then your immediate impactful submission right there is going to trump my cumulative number of attempts at a submission. Because remember, submission attempts is what's written here, not secured submissions. Just attempting submissions can be seen as effective grappling. Yes, not only do you get rewarded for attempting submissions, and they're failing, but submission attempts can actually be the most impactful thing to scoring a fight. It can trump everything. For an example, when you look back in the day when Rolls Nami Yunus fought Paige Van Zandt, and Rose got her in that rear naked choke and Paige Van Zandt was in there for a while and she was finding her way out of there. That might be the equivalent of knocking down someone and hitting him with ground upon and they survived. With Surreal Gone versus Francis Ngannou, when he got that second leg lock on him, although not the most effective submission attempt, it was the most effective thing that happened in the entire round. So that is one way to look at immediate and cumulative impact when it comes to submission attempts. And now with takedowns, you can see it as maybe someone takes me down a couple times with a single leg, a double leg, but they're not really getting too much out of it and they're not getting me all the way to the ground on my back and stuff. I'm able to scramble my way out of these multiple takedowns, but then I get a big slam on you. I elevate you, slam you on the ground one time. My one takedown may have more immediate impact than your cumulative takedowns. So it's not just taking somebody down, it's actually how you take them down as well. Daniel Cormier's takedowns back in the day where he would pick people up and slam them and stuff, those are some of the most impactful takedowns that you can ever get on somebody. That would be counted as effective grappling, so you can kind of get the gist of this. 
Now, when it talks about it shall be noted that a successful takedown is not merely a change of position, but the establishment of an attack from the use of the takedown. Now, this is important because that is the definition of a takedown when it comes to MMA. It's not merely taking somebody down, but you have to establish some kind of attack from the takedown for it to be a takedown. It could be quite confusing, but the way it's written is very simple. And that part I don't like. I think they should have detailed this a little bit more. They should bring in examples. They should have done a lot of things on that because not even the judges, it seems, know what takedowns actually are. I've gone through this in the past. I mean, there were multiple takedowns throughout the time that were not getting countered or rewarded, but they were very similar to other takedowns that happened before and after, and those will get rewarded and countered. The takedown part can be very confusing because what is an attack necessarily? Does that mean any attack? Does that mean if I punch you in the face after taking you down, this counts? Does it mean if I transition into another position, is that an attack just transitioning after I take you down? This part of the rules need to be distinguished a little bit more. Detailed for us to understand it a lot better. And the last thing when they're talking about top and bottom position fighters are assessed more unimpactful and effective result of their actions more than their position. This is pretty much just saying if I'm on my back or if I'm on top, it doesn't mean I'm winning or losing. You have to do something with that position. So a lot of people see someone on the bottom and automatically think they're losing the fight. The rules here state that is not the case. Just because they're on the bottom does not mean they're losing. The next thing they talk about here is, pretty much if effective striking and grappling is not 100% equal in the round, you do not go to aggressiveness. If it is 100% equal, and they mean 100% equal to the naked eye when they're judging, then you go to effective aggressiveness. This is the main reason why we don't get 10-10 rounds. That part right there. Because they made it in a way where scoring around a draw is not necessary. They don't want that to happen. And it's nearly impossible to ever do. How many rounds can we count over the past couple years that should have been 10-10 rounds? A lot of them, man. But the way the rules are written, it's pretty much impossible. And think about that. How hard it is to actually score aggressiveness because striking and grappling is never going to be equal. So how are you ever going to get the control? It's never going to happen. Now, if some way striking and grappling is 100% equal, now we'll look at effective aggressiveness, even though we probably never have to do this. Aggressively making attempts to finish the fight. The key term is effective. Chasing after a point with no effective result or impact should not render in the judge's assessments. Unquote. Pretty simple. Not just running forward. If you're actually attempting to finish the fight and you're, let's say you're hitting the opponent using your aggression, instead of just running forward and getting tagged yourself, then you are winning the round according to aggressiveness. So for an example, with Israel Adesanya, a lot of his opponents do not have effective aggressiveness, even though he's the one backing up in a lot of fights, or Wonderboy Thompson. He's backing up in a lot of fights, but a lot of his opponents are not having effective aggressiveness because they're running into shots, they're not getting anything out of it, they're just being reckless instead of using effective aggressiveness. And that is the biggest difference there. Now, if somehow even aggressiveness is 100% equal between the two fighters, then you go to octagon control, or as they say, fighting area control, which is, quote, Assessed by determining who is dictating the pace, place, and position of the fight, unquote. There you have it. So whoever is controlling how the fight is playing out, how fast the fight is going, how slow the fight is going, the placement of the fight, that actually doesn't always mean the guy that's backing up is losing control. They can actually have the control and being pushed back a bit. It just has to be in an intelligent way. But the more important thing that I want to talk about is position. Because of how vaguely position is written out here, I mean, look how short that definition is of octagon control. This also means when it comes to the ground, if I am simply laying on top of you and doing nothing, it is not getting scored because that is dictating the position. Dictating the position is what, for an example, Holly Holm did against Caitlin Vieira, held her up against the cage. According to the rules, it's the least important thing when it comes to judging and probably will never be scored ever. Go back and when you look at Francis Gano versus Surreal Gan. Francis Gano just held him down in that fifth round and did nothing. And because of the submission attempts and all that stuff from Surreal Gan, Gan should have won that fifth round. When you look at Corey Sandhagen versus TJ Dillashaw, TJ had more control with his grappling. Baltimore didn't do much with it, it should not have been scored at all. So as we see right here, when it comes to scoring a fight based on the criteria, effective striking and grappling, effective aggressiveness, and fighting area control, over 90% of the time, you're probably never going to score aggressiveness. Nearly 100% of the time, you're never going to score fighting area control. So forget about control, forget about dictating pace, place, and position. That is never going to even matter. So moving on forward, you're only really going to score fights based on effective striking and grappling, and maybe on a very rare occasion, as we've seen a couple times over the years, you will get to aggressiveness, but you'll probably never get to fighting area control. This is almost irrelevant for us to look at when it comes to judging. So pretty much, who does the most damage? Who gets closer to finishing off the match? 
that's who wins a fight. So a couple of things I would like to change about the scoring system. Number one, be more lenient on 10-8 rounds, 10-7 rounds, if we're going to keep the 10-point must system, because the way they're written now in the rules, they're so subjective, it's insane. It's pretty much written as whatever the judge feels like. When you read it, that's what it seems, because there's so many definitions of how a 10-8 round is scored. It's pretty much just saying, if the judge just sees it a little bit more dominant for one fighter, then just give him a 10-8. And because of the subjectivity of how a 10-8 round is scored, you're giving something like the first round of the rematch in Adesanya vs. Whitaker a 10-9. How is that first round a 10-9? The rest of the rounds are for sure 10-9. That first round is not the same. And the crazy thing is the new rules have become more lenient to give 10-8 rounds, but they're still too rare. If it's obvious that certain rounds are more one-sided than others in a single fight, they should not be all scored the same. And that also goes into 10-10 rounds. That should be more lenient. We should see more draws. Too many rounds are getting scored based on how impossible it is to score things a draw that we're not seeing them when they're necessary there's too many rounds that should have been 10 tens i would also like to see them scoring fights as a whole and not round by round if we were to score fights as a whole max holly would have beaten volkanovsky in their second fight but because it was round by round holloway had the most impactful first two rounds they should not have been scored the same as the rest of three that went to volkanovsky but even though volk was not as effective in those last three rounds as holloway was for the first two because it was scored round by round you give Volkanovski three rounds, which is not right. So a way to solve that is, be more lenient with 10-8s, those first two rounds could have been 10-8 for Holloway, and then the rest are 10-9, Holloway still wins the fight, or you score the fight as a whole, what happened in the beginning of the fight, the first two rounds, were more effective than what Volkanovski did for the rest of the three. And I know what everybody wants to talk about, the whole open scoring thing. I don't know about open scoring, because there's pros and cons with it. Open scoring is not going to solve every issue, but it will solve some while creating others. For an example, if there is open scoring, if a fighter knows that he won the first three rounds of a five round fight, he might go and coast, even risking losing the next two knowing that he's going to win the fight. So he might just not do much for the fourth and fifth rounds. That is the bad thing about this. But the good thing, the pros of open scoring is you will never have a fight like Carla Esparza versus Rose Namajunas. You might never have a fight that bad because both fighters thought they were winning the fight and they were ultimately doing nothing. If Rose saw that she was losing on the scorecards, let's say she goes into the fourth round, she's going to have to make something happen, or she's going to ultimately lose the fight. So you're never going to have two fighters that are doing nothing in an open scored fight, but you might have one fighter that might try to do nothing. An argument against that is, well, if a fighter is losing, they're going to try to make something happen. So there's always going to be some sort of action. You're never going to have a lolling fight. For an example, Derek Lewis and Francis Zaganu might not have gone that way if they knew how the fight was being scored. Israel Adesanya versus Yuval Romero, if Romero knew he was losing the fight, he probably would have done more. So I don't know if I want open scoring or not. The thing that I like the most about it is, for fans, it could be pretty fun to know who's winning and losing. A thing I love about boxing is when they have like uh, Letterman, I think he still does it. I don't know though. He does his own scoring. Even though he's not a judge, he's given his opinions on it. I love seeing that in between rounds. Now, an interesting dynamic about scoring is a point pool. Pretty much certain shots count for a certain amount of points. And it's not based on like a 10 point must system necessarily. It's more focused on how many points a fighter is able to accumulate over a fight. That could be pretty interesting, but the subjectivity on a method like that would be so crazy that you're going to need people that know how to fight or people that know how powerful a punch is and whatnot to score fights. You could not have just regular judges that don't know much about fighting to do that. So that is ultimately how you score fights and some things I would change. It seems like there's nothing that would make a perfect system. There's always gonna be pros and cons with everything, but it is best to look at some of the more regional organizations on how they're scoring fights because they do experiment with different things. And again, if someone is annoying you about judging and saying, oh, this fighter is robbed, that fighter is robbed, please show them this video. 